All right, so um, I'm hoping to wrap up the rest of this sort of uh, discussion on uh, feminist ethics and the ethics of care in one video, but uh, if I need to do two videos, that's fine. Um, so in the last video, we left off here, this notion that when it comes to distinctions between biological sex and gender, um, biological sex is sort of obviously a natural fact, and then gender is what we would call a social fact. So gender consists of roles and expectations and norms, um, which are enforced and uh, sort of valued by you know institutions of power and spheres of influence, right? So it's it's in um, our social organizations and institutions that we codify a set of values and we sort of communicate what we value as a society as far as our norms um, and gender roles and everything else. Okay, so um, largely what all feminists would agree on is that the biological facts, you know, facts about your hormones, facts about your sexual organs in your anatomy, even facts about your, you know, your DNA and your genetic coding and these kinds of things, these don't determine uh, the social facts. They don't strictly determine the social facts. Okay, now, but let's assume for the moment that facts about biological sex, you know, whether an individual is biologically male or biologically female, um, even if we wanted to say that these kinds of facts strictly determine the social facts, you know, the, the gender norms, and expectations and behaviors and those kinds of things. Um, there are two problems here. Uh, one, what kinds of biological facts are actually going to be the ones we're pointing to here? Um, I mean, are we pointing to hormones? Are we pointing to uh, reproductive organs and things like that? Even if we point to DNA, this is going to be problematic. Um, now, and here is why. The reason why this is going to be problematic is because uh, even if the biological facts strictly determine the social facts, the biological facts are themselves indeterminate, okay? So if you want, basically, if you want to ground a gender binary in a biological sex binary, well, scientifically, we know, empirically, we know that biological sex is non-binary. Why? Um, it's possible to be born with uh, both sets of reproductive organs, um, it's possible to have mixed hormone levels, and, and one of the biggest misconceptions is to think of testosterone as the, the, the male hormone, and then estrogen as the female hormone, and even um, we can have mixed chromosomes, we can have missing chromosomes, and now we know that there aren't strict like genetic makeup for male and female that our, our DNA and our genetics is so individuated biologically that you know no there's no magic determinant level here okay now and if you have a set of values that are strictly binary and are determinately binary um there aren't going to be any vague or borderline cases okay so if a set of facts is determinately binary then there aren't going to be any borderline cases of those facts you know so a, a binary would be a two value system so we talk about you know binary logic you know a zero and a one right so there there's no borderline cases between zero and one now but if biolog if biology is itself indeterminate meaning that there are borderline biological cases that there there aren't strict binaries in biology well if you want to get a gender binary by grounding it in in determinate facts about biology well given the fact that biological facts are indeterminate even if the biological facts strictly determine the social facts well that means given that the biological facts are indeterminate the social facts are going to be indeterminate anyways all right so e even if you want to say there's no distinction between being a man and a woman and being biologically male and biologically female even these categories of biologically male and biologically female there are borderline cases it's vague there there aren't determinate facts about you know male and female even biologically so there can't be normative uh you know binary facts about gender about the kinds of roles and expectations that men have and the roles and expectations and and norms and behaviors that women ought to exhibit and so on and so forth okay all right now 
the other distinction that I want to mention here, just in general, as far as um, the liberation of women, um, would be this distinction between liberal feminism on the one hand, and then what's known as radical feminism on the other hand. Okay, now, and by liberal, we don't mean like leaning to the left. We're, so the distinction here is not about the difference between being liberal and conservative. Uh, liberal feminism is a type of feminism that's um, sort of largely um, developed in terms of the tenets of classical liberalism. So here, uh, obviously, emphasis on justice and autonomy and democracy and free market capitalism and those kinds of things. So uh, the classical liberal model basically treats human individuals as rational, self-interested, and inherently free. Uh, the, the notion of natural rights or inalienable rights, I mean, this is a, a classical liberal view, you know, human rights sort of runs parallel, you know, is, is developed in terms of a classical liberal model of society and politics. Okay, now, so a liberal feminist would say, all right, when it comes to things like free market capitalism and American democracy, um, clearly there are problems. There, there are problems with you know, free market capitalism and American democracy, um, trampling people's rights. Uh, there have been people that have been oppressed and exploited and marginalized because of free market capitalism and because of American democracy in particular, and even Western imperialism and those kinds of things, uh, colonialism. But um, these are things that are largely symptoms. So we can actually use the tenets of you know, classical liberal political philosophy, uh, we can use capitalism and we can use democracy to sort of fix the system itself. Okay, so these are side effects. Now, radical feminists are of a different stripe. Radical feminists are going to say, no, the problems of, you know, systems of domination and exploitation and marginalization and oppression, um, these are not symptoms of things like capitalism and American democracy. These things are bedrock. Right, so you you can't use uh, an an inherently corrupt system to fix the system. Why you, you might be able to lower the amount of people or change the people that are being oppressed or marginalized, but if if exploitation and oppression through things like imperialism and colonialism and things like that. Um, are just bedrock to the system, then the only way to fix the problem, the only way to liberate women in this case, um, is to completely change the system, to completely overthrow the system, okay? Now, and one thing that's important is feminists recognize that a lot of the social institutions and organizations which have been oppressive and exploitative and marginalizing of women, um, th these are the same kinds of institutions and organizations that have also been oppressive and exploitative to persons of color, to members of LGBTQ communities, and things like that. So largely, um, there's, there's a structural similarity between systems of domination and systems of oppression in society and if those, if, if oppression and exploitation are just kind of bedrock to the way we organize ourselves within American democracy or a, a free market capitalist society, whatever the case may be, then the only way to fix the problem, if, if that problem is just part of the system itself, is to overthrow the system. Okay, so obviously that's going to be a major area of contention here. Um, our oppression and exploitation uh, and domination side effects, or are they bedrock? Okay, now, and by radical, we don't mean like way out there and extreme, although, you know, you can use the term radical to talk about um, individuals that whose views are just way out there in left field. No, radical comes from the Greek word radix, which means root. So, you know, if we're radical in that regard, we want to get to the very root of the problem. Now, another way, another way of using the term radical is to use um, unsanctioned and unconventional means. So clearly dismantling capitalism and, and uh, you know, getting rid of American democracy, that would be a, a rather unsanctioned and unconventional means. Usually we want to use democratic principles and democratic 
procedures and processes to fix the problems of our democracy. So that's where more of the liberal feminist would stand on these kinds of things. Okay. So, um, and again, this is another reason why there's more than one feminism. You know, there are feminisms. So um, one feminist who might be broadly libertarian and laissez-faire free market capitalist who says, no, American democracy and, and a free market capitalist society are good things. And, and we can actually use these kinds of things to liberate women and members of other marginalized and historically uh, oppressed and exploited groups. Yet yeah, these things are good. A radical feminist will say, no, um, if you look at the development of capitalism, the very nature of capitalism is to be exploitative, right? You know, so there are feminists with Marxist leanings, there are feminists with proto-libertarian leanings, right? So that, again, that's why you can't paint um, all feminists with the same broad brush because, right, because the, the, the philosophical uh, sort of bases in which, our, in which feminism is articulated, that's going to vary, you know, based on other kinds of philosophical commitments that you have, okay? All right, now, so what does all of this have to do with ethics? Aha. Okay, now, another important distinction here in this conversation is this distinction between the public and the private domains of life. Okay, so when we're talking about the pri public domain of life, we are talking about um, what takes place in society and politics and economics. So the, the public domain is the domain of the politicians um, and the artisans and the teachers and, you know, individuals that are art outside of the home in the workforce. And then the, the private domain, this would be the domain of the home. This would be the domain of the family. Okay. Now, and historically, obviously, men um, have largely occupied the public domain of life and women have largely occupied the private domain, right? So traditionally speaking, as far as division of labor and roles and responsibilities and expectations, you know, historically, especially in Western society, there's an expectation that the men is the men are the ones who leave the home and work and then the women are the ones who stay at the home and care for the home and care for the children and cook the food and all of that sort of stuff you know i've, I've already alluded to all of that okay but uh, why is this distinction between the public and the private so important uh with respect to ethics well traditional approaches to ethics have largely been formulated in masculine kinds of contexts right so uh most moral theorists and philosoph philosophers in general have been men in particular, okay? And to the extent that men and women might um, be inclined and have dispositions to processing information differently and things like this, um, the way that moral theories are articulated traditionally values and puts a higher precedence on traits and principles and you know, virtues in particular that we would associate with being traditionally masculine. Um, so in particular would be demands to be objective and rational and impartial in our decision making. So there's an emphasis here on moral rules and principles um, needing, needing to be universalizable. Okay. Now, and that's not to say that women are incapable of being objective and rational and impartial and, and just logical and non-emotional. I mean, so we're not here to say that men are rational and women are emotional. No, that's not what we mean. But if you think of sort of stereotypes and associations between the genders, you know, women are usually characterized, just traditionally speaking, as being more emotional and sentimental and men usually are characterized as being more cerebral and dispassioned and stoic about things. I mean, so the moniker, you know, boys don't cry. You know, boys are taught from a young age to sort of bury their emotions down. Men have, you know, can struggle with connecting with their emotions or being emotionally mature because, you know, from a young age, a lot of young boys and young men are taught to, you know, if you cry or if you show any sort of emotion or any sort of vulnerability, that is a sign of weakness. So, you know, vulnerability 
and being you know sentimentally open and mature you know, leave that to the the women you know the women can get together and cry together but you know us guys we just don't do that you know it's a sign of weakness now that's completely false it's completely false that being emotional and, and being vulnerable are signs of weakness now but the reason why they're characterized as signs of weakness is because that's the, the way that masculinity has been passed down um, from generation to generation to generation right so it's one of those again it's one of those sort of um, things that we learn just because it's largely been part of our institution that that is what we value you know as as masculine members of society if we want to be leaders in society we need to be courageous and we need to be bold and we need to take no prisoners and we need to you know win by any means necessary and we're seeing uh, you know men are encouraged as if life is a competition there are winners and there are losers and which side are you going to be on um and uh I, I would be shocked if any of this is sounding completely new to you right i mean this this is basically it's the warrior masculine mentality here and all of this kind of flows together socially okay now and the sort of liberal model of the human individual then emphasizes things like human rationality and autonomy freedom radical individualism um this whole um, i'm going to be completely self-sufficient and i'm going to be in a rock in, in an island as simon and garfunkel say uh i depend on no one and if i depend on no one i'm not in anybody's debt you know i'm going to be completely self-sufficient here okay so to the extent that the liberal sort of classical liberal model treats the rational self-interested and free individual as sort of the most atomic unit in a social organism so what is society made of society is made of a group of um, autonomous and free and rational and self-interested individuals well if, if that's the case if it is this rational autonomous and free uh, and self-interested individual which is basically the atomic cell in a social organism well what impact does this have on ethics then um, this means that the importance of ethics is largely a social one okay so why do we need ethics why do we need theories of right and wrong and theories of moral conduct well because we are rational and free and self-interested individuals who have rights and we recognize other people as being rational and free and self-interested and we recognize that they also have rights so the idea here is that if we lived in isolation from each other there largely wouldn't be any point to ethics okay so the very notion of having obligations seems to imply having obligations towards the other so if it weren't for the fact that we were individual units in a social organism engaged in various forms of commerce and various forms of social relationships with each other um, we would have no need for ethics we have need of ethics and an understanding of what is right and what is our duty precisely because we stand in close proximity socially to other individuals that are like us okay now if that's the case then if traditionally speaking whether you're a deontologist or a utilitarian classically um, ethics largely has social importance and this social role well that means that most of our moral relationships are predominantly seen as a set of mutually binding contractual arrangements okay so you know i am a free and rational member of society and i can choose to engage in certain social relationships with you and you can choose to engage in certain social relationships with me so think about it like a customer proprietor kind of relationship um, i walk into a business that is selling certain goods uh, a certain price is set for those goods and if i don't like those prices then i am free to go take my business elsewhere okay now but once me and the proprietor of the goods agree on a price and i care enough about this good or service that i'm willing to pay that price right this is a contractual arrangement okay so um and the idea here behind the language of a contract is that we are considered for the most part equals but the contract is going to apply univocally 
the idea is that, okay, well, I'm only going to agree to not steal from you if you also agree to not steal from me, right? So there's an emphasis on doing what is fair and on doing what is just um, and it all being objective and impartial and things like that, okay? Now, but here's the problem. The problem is that the traditional model cannot be used to appropriately characterize all moral relationships. Now, why is that? Um, it's, it's completely inadequate and it largely doesn't make any sense to characterize parent-child relationships or dependent uh, relationships using this kind of model. And here's why. Um, the parent-child relationship is not a matter of a mutually binding contract between two completely objective, rational, free, and autonomous parties, right? No child chooses the family that they are born into. So, I mean, there is a decision on the part of the parents to bring children into the world, but a lot of these kinds of relationships are involuntary, right? Um, so it's a mistake, the feminist is going to say, it's a mistake to characterize the sort of most atomic social unit ethically as the autonomous, free, rational individual. Why? None of us start out that way. Not, none of us, absolutely zero people have come into this world as a inherently free, rational, and autonomous and self-interested individual. We all come into the world self-interested. If you've spent any time about around babies, you know that babies are completely self-interested. But we don't start out just as an autonomous cell in a social unit that is radically autonomous and free and rational. No, we develop into rational, autonomous individuals. Why? because we have parents that raise us to be that way, right? So every rational autonomous individual that is now sort of a, a cell in a social organism that is able to freely engage in commerce and other kinds of freely chosen relationships, the only reason why that is possible, it, the only reason why it is possible for us to be autonomous and rational and free individuals is because we came into the world as completely vulnerable and dependent beings. Children, babies are completely dependent upon their caregivers and are completely dependent upon their parents, right? And again, that is not a, a contractual arrangement. Parents do not negotiate with their babies okay, I will agree to free, feed you as long as you, you agree to not pee on me. No, parents have obligations towards their children regardless of whether or not the children keep their end of the bargain here. Why? There is no bargain. This is not a, a mutually agreed upon contractual arrangement at all. Now, and since none of us come into the world as this radically autonomous and objective and, and free and rational individual since every single one of us um, had a set of guardians or caregivers because we were completely vulnerable and completely dependent we develop into rational free individuals but that is not sort of the individual sort of uh, primitive social unit of society the the individual primitive social unit of society is the family organism. That is the primitive. That That is kind of the irreducible social unit, not the radically autonomous and free individual, right? Okay, so every one of us, every single one of us uh, came into the world as completely vulnerable, all right? And I thought I had a slide on this. Yeah, I got them backwards. So we do not begin our lives as rational, autonomous individuals. We begin as completely dependent and vulnerable, okay? Now, and if that is the case, and if that kind of dependence and vulnerability is really, really, really important to who we are as human individuals, then the feminists are just going to say, okay, well, that needs to be taken into account in the way that we articulate our understanding of ethics, okay? now. So feminist versions of ethics and femi feminist and, and, uh, and ethics of care versions of ethics. The idea here is, is not that feminist ethics is going to supplant 
traditional understanding. So to the extent that, so take utilitarianism and deontology. So to the extent that utilitarians are gonna focus on beneficence and non-maleficence largely, and, and deontologists are gonna focus on you know, justice and consistency, making sure that our moral rules are consistent. Um, feminists don't have a problem with that. So feminists care just as much about justice as anybody else does. No. So what feminist ethicists are saying is that these characterizations of ethics are, are incomplete. Yeah. So justice is important. Beneficence and non-maleficence. Yes, these things are important, but the the domain of ethics the the totality of all our moral relationships and and moral arrangements cannot be fully explained in terms of just justice or cannot be fully explained in terms of just beneficence and non-maleficence and other kinds of abstract um universalizable moral rules and moral principles it's it's just way too short-sighted to think that traditional ways of understanding ethics um, can actually give the entire picture here or tell the full story um, about moral phenomena. No, um, given the fact that the parent-child relationship does, the parent-child relationship does involve really, really, really important moral components here, but a parent-child relationship cannot be fully captured in terms of just objective moral rules and principles like you know, pertaining to justice and, you know, particularly beneficence and non-maleficence, right? Why? Because the, the, the parents are the ones, the guardians, the caretakers, they, they give a lot more than they actually receive back in this relationship. So there, there's, there's an unequal distribution of, you know, the care. So the one doing the caring gets less from the relationship than the individual being cared for does a lot of the time. So, I mean, I have three kids and it's exhausting caring for them. Okay. Now, the other problem is this. Traditional theories that focus on just following or acting in accordance with, with universal, uh, universizable or universalizable uh, rules and principles and things like that. In society, there's this notion of Okay, well, justice just requires that I do the bare minimum required of me as an individual, right? Whether I like it or not, or whether um, I take any joy in doing what I am required to do, morally speaking, that is irrelevant. So if I go to work every day and I hate my job, but I show up on time, while I'm at work, I do what I'm what's required of me, and then I leave my job, you know, all that's required of me, um, I'm just doing the bare minimum of what is morally required. Okay, but what do we think of parents that just do the bare minimum of what's required? Um, and I'm going to try to talk about this without uh, crying, but I make no promises. I mean, um, if my son comes to me and asks me if I love him, and I say, what do you mean do I love you? Look, I go to work every day so that you can have food, you have a nice warm bed to sleep in, you have this house, you have a backyard to play in. What do you mean, do I love you? You know, I think what my son would be asking me is, is not, am I doing right by him? But as, as a parent, do I find joy in him and do I delight in him? I mean, when, when parents don't find joy or do not delight in the lives of their children, are these good parents? I mean, I mean, is a good parent the kind of individual whose model of parenting is I am only going to do the bare minimum that is required of me as a as a father or as a mother, and I'm going to do nothing else. I am only going to do the bare minimum of what's required because that is all that justice requires of me. That's not good parenting. Okay, but if that's not good parenting, then this kind of traditional model of either justice or beneficence or non-maleficence or respect for rights or demand for rights, that is a really, really, really incomplete moral picture. Why? Because the parent-child relationship, once again, is not only a morally important relationship, it's a socially important 
relationship, given the fact that every single one of us start out that way. But if traditional models of justice and beneficence and non-maleficence that we have in deontology and utilitarianism, if that can't give the full picture, then that means that traditional approaches to morality are wholly inadequate to tell the full story or to give us the full picture. Okay. All right. So I said I was going to do this in one video, but I need another video. All right. So I'll see you then.